So please join me in welcoming Mickey Blanco. So, Mickey, we were ju you, you said you uh, haven't listened to that uh, track in a while. It is uh, from, your, uh, from your first mixtape, Cosmic Angel. Um, it's called Mendocino, California, um, by the way. And um, you recorded this in 2012 in New York. Can you tell us a little bit about that place at the time? Um, also from the perspective of you sort of being a, um, an artist trying to, trying to forge a path? So, uh, hi, hi guys, good evening. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you Red Bull for inviting me. Uh, this is cool. Okay, so um, in 2012, uh, when I was, I think I, I, yeah, so in 2012, I had been living in New York City since like 2008. Um, I had dropped out of college twice and I was like basically hustling. I was like interning for a lot of artists. I, I worked at this really cool store that was like half of like a, a skate shop, half of a bookstore. Um, and at the time I was pretty much trying to figure out a way to um, become like a successful contemporary artist. Um, I had always uh, imagined that I would make things, you know, like that I would make like sculptures or installations. Um, and what happened once I, I moved to, because I had this like romantic idea about being like a visual artist, you know? Um, and so what happened was that when I was in New York, I was just like so poor all the time that I couldn't really like afford <laughs> materials. So it's like, and I also couldn't afford like studio space, you know, I couldn't, so it was like me wanting to be this artist and like never having any money to like buy, buy like paint or like anything. And then also uh, just, it just it wasn't working. And so I remember I was having this conversation with my mom and my mom was just like, you know, Honey, I'm I'm not trying to, you know, be down on you. I'm not trying to be down on your dreams, but she was like you were always a much better writer than you were, you know. She was she was like I've always liked your writing much more than any of the visual art that I've really seen you make. I'm just being honest with you. I'm your mom. She was like you're just you're you're a much better writer. And I was kind of resisting that for a while. And then I just, you know, I, I kind of was like, you know, maybe I should start writing again. And so I started writing again a lot. And it was, it was, it was true. Like through, through the writing, I started to create these little narratives and, um, and, uh, and just all of these kind of like satellite ideas. And one day um, I had the idea for a performance art a performance art piece uh, about a girl who was a young black girl in America and who wanted to be, she was a teenager, well, she was like 18, and she wanted to be a famous female rapper. But she was like really rebellious and really radical and, you know, basically like my own personality traits put into this character. And so that was like the birth of Mickey Blanco. So when, you know, when I started Mickey Blanco, I did not start Mickey Blanco with the intention of being like a musical artist. Um, when I would think about the projects that I was making, when I made what you just listened to, which was like I recorded on my laptop, you know, that wasn't made to be, you know, that, that wasn't made to be on Spotify. <laughs> that was, you know, in my head at that time, that was something that like, if you had walked into like a gallery or you walked into like a museum, like, you know, one day you would have heard that plane. And, and so I just, everything at that time that I thought of, I thought of in the context of, of contemporary art. And it wasn't until I met a guy named Charlie Damga. And Charles uh, had a record label. He was a young guy and he had a record label called Uno NYC. And he had come to some of my shows because I had started performing out as, 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 as Mickey. 
And um, he had come to some of my shows, and one time, you know, he, he stopped me, and he was like, would you like to have a meeting? And I was like, sure, you know, a, a meeting about what? And he said, well, whether you know it or not, you're actually making music. And I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. <laughs> and then he was like, well, he was like, would you ever consider like putting out a release? And I was like, a release of what? And he was like, well, what you're doing is music. He was like, you're creating these songs. And he was like, what if you put all of these songs that you're creating on like one record and, and released it? And I was like, oh, okay, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, 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 let's try it, you know? Um, so it was through working with Charles that I started to ever even conceive of what I was doing as, as music. And, and it was also through Charles that I started to understand that these ideas that I was having that combined theater and performance art and gender performance, um, that that these were things that could fit under this umbrella of, of, of being a musical artist. And this was really like, this was kind of like a, a really breakthrough moment for me because, um, you know, I started to perform shows. I started to get paid for these shows. And, and this was all just, like I was just having this conversation with, a, with a, a woman that DJs with me about intention and about how with a lot of, younger artists now who have grown up with social media, you know, like, how can I put this? You have like a 21 year old, and I, and I actually know a person who's like this, someone who's 21 who like had their first release at 18, their second release at 19, and now at 21, they have like two agents and they're like doing it, you know what I mean? They're like literally full on at the beginning of their career, you know, at 21. Um, and they're like not with a major label, they're like a completely independent artist. And so it's like, but that person has always had the intention of like that being, you know what I mean? Like that person obviously wanted to be a musician. They wanted to, or they wanted to attain some level of, of fame or notoriety and they understood the blueprint to do that, you know? And so that was their intention and they were able to manifest that. I, this whole entire thing, this whole entire career that I've had, at least in the very nucleus of it, the very beginning of it, was so organic in that I did not have these intentions, and I truthfully did not have them. I had intentions of being like a successful kind of maybe cult, you know, contemporary artist, and and that was that was really it. I didn't I didn't think about myself as someone who had. Uh, uh, the intentions of being a famous musician or of going on world tours or even doing music videos. So when all of this happened uh, or, when, or really began to happen, it was like, how can I put this? Like, I, like I'm not, not to sound weird, but like I really come from like an underground background, like really underground, you know? So when all of this kind of started to happen, it really shifted my whole entire idea of what was possible for, for me as a human. <laughs> um, do we want to play a, uh, a video that maybe illustrates that a little bit from one of the No Fear performances? Oh, okay, yeah, so, okay, okay, so, well, so or what- do you want to say something? Well, I was gonna first? say, so what you're about to watch is, so before I had the idea for Mickey Blanco, I had um, this punk poetry project called No Fear. Uh, I had written all these poems, and uh, this art gallery had published my poems in this book. And uh, I started to perform the poems with like a bassist, and and then I would also make these like weird, you know, crunchy, noisy things. And and so yeah, so I I I had uh, this project called No Fear, and this was this was like about three years before Mickey Blanco, or two years maybe. Okay, let's uh, watch a little bit of that. Bear with me here to... Really very noisy. <laughs> Okay, so this was around 2010, um, No Fear. So you were performing some of the poems you had written um, also as part of, part of this performance? Yeah, uh, yeah, those were all... I mean, I, what, I, what I would do is basically, you know, I, I had... 
I had written this poetry book, but it's like, I mean, at the time I was like, who, I mean, I have this poetry book, I'm, I'm passionate about it, but who reads poetry? So I, I, I had the idea to put it to, you know, to, to noise music and yeah, that it, I would perform like a majority of the poems, like, 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 like that. <laughs> and um, in terms of, so I, from what I picked up, someone who kind of inspired you with that also in a way was Patti Smith of her kind of putting her poems um, to music. Um, I guess you can also kind of hear a little bit of like a suicide vibe on, on some of what you were going for. Can you talk a little bit about like the people who inspired you around then? Yeah, I was super, around this time, I was very, I, I was very inspired by suicide. Uh, definitely inspired by Patti Smith, but more inspired by suicide. And suicide were uh, Alan Vega and Martin Rev, and they were basically like two weirdos um, <laughs> from New York City um, in the 70s that started to make this kind of like extremely, extremely aggressive uh, noise music that was this like, comment, I mean, it was a lot of things, but really it had a lot to do with this like whole anti, it was like an, it was like anti-disco, anti-punk, like proto-punk. Uh, they, I mean, they, I mean, they would, they, they would do stuff like, they would take a, a chain and actually like whip their audience with it. You know what I mean? Like that kind of thing, that kind of like, uh, agitator stuff. Um, and I just, they, but, but they, they had this music, their, their music is really hard and really noisy, but then also, there's something almost like doo-wop about some of the songs, like like Frankie Teardrop. Also, they used a lot of like early synthesizer and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I was like really influenced uh, by by this lineage of like uh, the the movement is called like No Wave, which is like you know these are the, the, these bands and these acts that came out of New York City um, that were pre pre punk pre pre Pre-punk, yeah. I would say proto-punk. Proto-punk. Or, no, or, or post, no. That really proto. Proto, yeah. Proto, yeah. Um, so can you also say maybe a few words about the people who are performing with? Because I think uh, DJ Physical Therapy was also yeah. a part of that, and maybe... Yeah, so at the time uh, in New York City, like my friend Daniel, he was on drums, and he's, uh, he's a, he has a record label now called Allergy Season. His, his, his artist's name is... DJ Physical Therapy, and then uh, the other person that was with me is another friend of mine who's a contemporary artist now. His name is Jeffrey Joyle, and he was on on bass. And we were like we were like a little we were like a little thing for a moment. But also during this time period, see, and this is like you can never like you always have to like let people in on like the truth, like you know, like not like the the illusion. So. At this time, like, my mentor was this guy, Aaron Bondaroff, and he had a gallery with a guy named Al Moran. The gallery still exists. It's called, at the time it was called Oh Wow, but now it's just called Moran Moran. And anyway, they were like a gallery, and they were a new gallery, and they were like trying to get all this like respect in the art world. Um, and so they, 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 they would use this publicist in New York City, which is a really huge like fashion, publicist called Black Frame. And so when I came out with my book, like with them, it went through like their publicity channel. And so if you, like before Mickey Blanco, if you ever just Google my name, Michael David Quattlebaum Jr., like I started to kind of get attention as being like a young writer and a poet, like through kind of like this this whole little like media machine that they had going on. And so it would kind of, it would be untruthful to say that like when I began Mickey Blanco, people didn't already kind of, in New York at least, know who I, who, who I was, you know what I mean? Um, there was like a, a nucleus there of, of, of something happening. I didn't just like come out of like nowhere, you know what I mean? Um, these situations are very much so often about who you end up knowing or someone who ends up knowing, you know, you way back when, you know? Yeah, I think that speaks to also just kind of how those scenes were sort of connected, right, and the art forms. And um, 
So you, you mentioned you were doing poetry at that time. You were starting to get into uh, per performing music. Um, were you also still doing um, performance art and acting sort of around that time? I mean, because uh, I believe that's sort of where you started in a way also uh, creatively. Oh, so you want to go super way, way back. Well, maybe, you know, <laughs> uh, um, trace that trajectory for us of if, if that was something you were still kind of, kind of doing then when you got to New York. Okay, so... Um, I, I was doing performance art, but I wasn't really doing acting anymore. But, but what, he's, what he's basically talking about is, like, I was, like, a child actor, um, but not, like, in, like, Hollywood or something. Like, we, we lived at the time, we lived in North Carolina. And uh, so in North Carolina, uh, in this town called Wilmington, there used to be these film studios called Screen Gems. And... Uh, what was a really big show that... Okay, so one of the big TV shows that were filmed at Screen Gems was... Do you all remember uh, hearing about a show called Dawson's Creek? So Dawson's Creek was filmed at Screen Gems. Uh, a couple of movies were. Um, so they're there... And, and anyway, uh, so uh, I was a part of this thing in, in my hometown in Raleigh called Kids on Broadway. And... Um, we were basically like little drama, like little drama freaks, and we were like doing musicals and all this stuff. And I remember like one of the girls in our group ended up getting an agent, and she was like in a CBS movie. And I was just like, well, I want an agent too. Um, well, I always make jokes with my mom because like usually in these situations, the parents are really pushing the kids, and I was it was the complete opposite. I would on I would I would get up I would I would get the newspaper, like like you know like like I was you know some like thirty year old out of work actor and I was like twelve years old, I would get the newspaper, I would see like I would look I would search the newspaper for auditions, and then if I saw something that was for kids I would circle it and like ask my mom if you know like mommy can you take me, and so. Uh, she would, you know, she, if she had the time, if she wasn't working, you know, if it was the weekend, she would. And, uh, and so, like, yeah, I, w I was a kid actor. And I think one of the biggest things, one of the two biggest things I did was uh, this, like, off-Broadway play about, like, Eleanor Roosevelt. And then the other thing was I was in this, it's, it, it, like, I was, like, a, what do they call it, a stand-in. So there was this main kid who was the kid actor, and I was the stand-in, but the other biggest thing I did was I was in this Oprah Winfrey television movie called, called The Wedding, and it starred uh, Halle Berry and a couple of other, Lynn Whitfield, a couple of other really notable black American actors, and it was filmed in, in North Carolina. And, and Oh, you're about to show that. <laughs> I'm about to show it. Just show the photo. And so this is from my child actor days, like... That's <laughs> but but this is I guess it's it's really telling because it's like I I did always I I have always liked performing, you know what I mean? Um I've always liked performing and 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 even when I was kind of on this trip about really wanting to be like a contemporary artist, you know, I still there was still this element of 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 performance, you know. Um, I just, I just never would have thought though that, that, because really what well, also another dimension of what ended up happening with Mickey Blanco was that this idea, uh, for Mickey Blanco ended up really, really transforming at the time, like my gender identity. Um, I guess we can, we, I don't know if we'll segue into that, but, uh, it, 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 it became so much more than just like an idea, you know, and, and, and it really, if, if I really want to be, you know, meditative and reflective about it, it was as if the idea really was, uh, something within my subconscious that was, you know, coming, that was, that was being birthed, that was always there. Um, so at what time did, what was that moment? So it happened, it, re it, really, it really happened like this. Am I, is this sounding too close or too muffled or I'm trying to like, is that okay? I don't, it's okay? Okay. So it really, it really happened like this. Um, I think when, when I was younger, I, I think when I was younger, uh, maybe people considered me like, you know, like a, you know, okay looking and an attractive child. And then I remember 
uh, once I came out of the closet, there's, there's, you know, as a, as a teenager, you know, there's all this awkwardness, you know, about, you know, your sexuality and your looks and what people think of you. And, but I, I kind of, you know, I was able to, I think I had, let me see, I had about three boyfriends as a teenager. And then I went to college and it was this weird thing where like college was this very isolating experience where for some reason I went to college at the, for the, for the first time in the Midwest and and uh, this was in 2005, and I just remember, you know, coming from California there, and people would point at me on the street, like, like I mean, this this was before you could, on, honestly, this is before people like were wearing skinny jeans. So if you wore skinny jeans, if you wore skinny jeans, like people would point at you and be like, what, like, what are you, you know? And people who are, uh, I'm 33, so people who are around my age know exactly what I'm talking about. But uh, you know, but when I was there in Chicago, people would point at me and scream at me and, 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 and nail nasty things at me. And so my self-esteem went way down. I started to feel really unattractive and ugly and, and so um, and just really not good about myself. And so when I moved to New York, that kind of shifted again where I started to feel more comfortable. For the first time, I had a really diverse range of, 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 of gay and trans and lesbian friends. And so... With Mickey Blanco, Mickey Blanco really did begin as this, as this conceptual art idea. Then what happened was, the more, because I, I would basically, I would dress up in drag for the first time, I'd never done it before, I was 25, I would dress up in drag and I would create these videos, you know, as Mickey, rapping or, um, or, or, or almost like, like vlogging, you know, like, like, like in this kind of like, it, it, like in my mind, like I, it was almost as if like a Cindy Sherman kind of thing, but uh, but I was talking to the camera, making these di these diaries, and and what 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 would happen is that I would get into drag and I would I, I would I would first of all I would look dramatically different, but then I would start to feel different, and but everything was happening inside the apartment. I was never leaving the house, and. I started to get people having, like I started to have people complimenting how I would look on the internet and being just like, oh, no, I didn't know you could look like this. Oh my God, you're so pretty as a girl. And then one day, I'll never forget, I just was like, I'm gonna like go somewhere, like, you know, as Mickey Blanco. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave the house in drag for the first time. And so like I took about like three hours to do my makeup and like get myself together. And I left the house for the first time in drag. And I will never forget that feeling of feeling, first of all, the way that the public reacted, but then in myself, like this, this confidence and this, uh, I don't know. It was. It, it honestly felt like almost felt spiritual, really, because it was. It was. It, it was as if I had entered. I mean, like another dimension. Um, uh, all of a sudden, without me realizing it, my mannerisms were changing. You know, um, and uh, and I and I and I and I started to go out. You know, more and more. You know. Uh, in, in drag, and then it became less about it being drag, and then I was just dressing up. And, you know, no one was really, you know, well, I shouldn't say no one, but my close friends weren't really questioning me about it. You know, people were, um, I, I, if anything, I was more being encouraged by my friends, you know, but no one was really asking me, you know, no one, no one was asking me like, oh, are you transgender now, or oh, are you, are you changing your gender, or, you know, oh, or, you know, and, and also, I wasn't necessarily, I wasn't telling people not to call me he, or I wasn't saying, oh, you can't call me Michael, it was just like, I am now, <laughs> it was just like, I am, I am now, like, fully, you know, made up, um, you know, and this is how I feel comfortable, and it also wasn't, it was something that I was doing a lot, I would probably say, probably four times out of a seven-day week, I was dressing up, but I wasn't dressing up, like, every single day, you know, um, at one point, I was dressing up every single day, um, but... It, it was like, uh, it's like you go through your, it's like, how can I put this? As a boy, and especially as like a little black boy, 
you can go through life, you know, having people tell you like, oh, like, oh, he's a handsome young guy or something like that. But when someone calls you pretty for the first time, and not even calls you pretty, but for the first time you feel pretty, that's a very different feeling. It's a very different feeling than feeling handsome. It's a very different feeling than, uh, than, than, than I don't know, feeling just okay, or I, I don't know. It just is, the, 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 there's something that happens to you when you feel pretty. And, um, and I began to explore that feeling more. And um, then, yeah, and, and, then, and then what really happened was that Mickey became not just this performance art persona or this character. I really came full circle to realize that Mickey was always me. Um, it was always the way more feminized side of my personality, and that really th this idea for this character was really, you know, a part of myself really being, being birthed for the first time. Um, I'd like to play a video, um, one of your early videos as Mickey Blanco um, joined my militia. Oh, okay, yeah, and you know what? Well, you know what? I have a, I have a question. Can we play the poetry video first and then Let's join my that. militia? Because mm -hmm. I want to play the poetry video first because this really shows the link between before I was rapping and when I was still just reciting poetry and when I was becoming Mickey Blanco. And, and the Join My Militia video, I want to talk about that after because that video was a rejection of what this was. And that's also important to talk about. So I'm not even going by Mickey Blanco here. Interesting. From and also, wait, pause really quickly. To the noise so, of boys. Pause it. So this is interesting. So look at that. Look how un-PC that is. Fader calling me cross-dresser poet extraordinaire. Anyway, so we'll also, we'll, we'll no, we'll, well, because this is also really important. And this is really important when you talk about me because even though I stand behind a lot of the things that I've done that I know that people feel are radical and that I know that people may have felt are pioneering, I'm also someone who has benefited from really being and making work at the right place, at the right time, in the right context, and, and then going for it. Because the fact that, okay, this is 2011, and Fader you know, is calling me cross-dresser poet extraordinaire, that shows you that the acceleration point for how our culture talks about queer people and the LGBT has changed so dramatically in just seven years or six years. And so while I'm a part of that zeitgeist, I think people are already forgetting that all of this is still so new in the public sphere, in the public dialogue. So let's go. And, and so, um, and so really what, what started to happen uh, also at this time was that, uh, so you know, this always happens, and not always, but this can happen a lot within the culture industry, and especially the fashion industry, where sometimes some of the most subversive or political ide ideologies will get picked up by the fashion industry first, um, just for, for the sheer fact that at the speed with that industry moves at, and, and, and the fact that that, that, that that industry always needs an aesthetic and an ideology to kind of keep itself, you know, regurgitating like this, you know, this big giant chimera. And so in New York, the fashion industry really kind of like, kind of accepted me first before like the world of music because, um, yeah, it, 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 just kind of, it kind of just, just happened. And, uh, and so I remember I did, I did a video like this and I did some other things and, and, you know, all of a sudden, I, you know, this, this, you know, little black boy from North Carolina and California, you know, I was doing like, I mean, even though this is quite controversial now at the time, it wasn't as much. I was doing like photo shoots with like Terry Richardson and I was doing ad campaigns. I remember I hosted this party with like Chloe Sevigny and, you know, I, I, I was just like, oh my God, I, I guess I'm an it girl now. Like I'm an it girl. And, you know, for a few months, I guess I was an it girl. And, um... But before we, but, but this is what's important though. I was quickly realizing that, I was quickly realizing that people were not understanding the context of what I was doing. So it's like you have 
people really not understanding that I was trans, but me also not really understanding that I was trans and kind of not fully identifying as trans. And then you also have this lineage of drag being comedy. So before me, I think, I mean, and I'm not talking of all of history, but I'm talking about just in hip hop. I think before me, the only person that you had rapping was this artist named Caswell. And he's um, a white guy, and the raps were really always really funny. Like they were really, uh, they were really, really like this kind of like kind of tacky, cheesy, funny humor. Um, and that's no offense to him. It's true. I mean, he has one of his most famous songs, I think, is I Saw Beyonce at Burger King. So it was this kind of really, really, really high camp thing. And that was not at all what I was doing. And so um, I, I, I remember uh, telling my manager, uh, Charles, because now I had a manager. <laughs> I remember telling Charles, I was like, you know what? I have to show people many different sides of Mickey Blanco because if I keep doing this fashion stuff, people are going to think that this is just like another topical, uh, you know, just, you know, you know, uh, you know, drag queen that just wants to be pretty all the time. And that's what this is about. People are going to think this is a joke. People are gonna, not going to understand. I said, so I, I created this idea of Mickey Blanco being a mutant, which was also, you know, a metaphor for being gender nonconforming. And um, uh, so one of the first producers that I ever were, and this is also, now, yeah, some of this stuff sounds really mythological and I talk about it, but then I understand why people want to listen to it. Um, <laughs> but one of the first producers I ever worked with was Arca when he was a freshman at NYU. And so, or when, she, sorry, when she was a freshman at NYU. And, um, and so uh, it's this song that we made called Join My Militia. And when, we, when it came time to conceptualize the video, I said, I don't want to do this video. No false eyelashes, no red lipstick. We're not going to make this pretty. I want this to be horrorcore, which was this horrorcore was this genre of 90s hip hop that was like goth. It was like death and, you know, it was like really hard stuff. I could name off the artist, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> but just Google horrorcore hip rap. So anyway. Um, the song, you already had the song at that time? It was just about the video? Or uh, did the song come well, With I was that in, in mind as well. Okay, so I was influenced by I was I was I was influenced by by horrorcore, but really the video I think takes on um, <clears throat> takes on that element. I remember when we were we were we were making the idea for this video. I told the director I was like, I want this to feel like the Simple Life entered the Blair Witch Project, and and uh, and that's kind of how yeah how this this moment happened and. Uh, even like the even the lyrics, Mickey Digital Sound Waves, Mickey Digital Sound Wave Oasis. Niggas got the itis, hit him with a basic, uh, make it so good a nigga wanna try it, taste it. Straight jacket the beat, though it gets away in places. This right here, Joe is Blanco voodoo. It's black magic music, nigga Blanco hoodoo. They kept me in this holding cell for close to eight days. They could keep me here forever because my story won't change. His name, Hassan Abdul, weight 170, height 6'2", size 12 shoe, black hair, brown eyes, uh, the warmest smile but so cold-blooded inside. Who am I to judge him? I hate him, but I love him. Inshallah, he whispered, mashallah, ma, I whimpered, damn. I didn't know my man was in the, the Taliban, t t, -t taliban <laughs> And so that, <laughs> and so that was that was my very first music video, and I, yeah, I just I, I I was like I wanted people to know that like that this was not this was not what you if you thought this was gonna be some like rapping drag queen to make you laugh this is not what that's about and you know what's funny I <clears throat> the most and it's in the it's in the title of the song but I forgot. The most important lines in that whole entire song is, is Nas, Nas gave me a perm. He said, you've got the hidden gift, kid. Lead them. They'll learn. And I remember that had so much to do with this feeling when I wrote this song, this feeling of, 
of what am I getting myself into? Like, like people, this is like pe pe people were already people were already just so homophobic and mean to me from walking from like walking from like the corner store to like my apartment. So, I yeah, it was God. Yeah, Nas gave them a perm. Nas gave me a perm. He said, "You've got the hidden gift, kid. Lead them. They'll learn." And yeah, that like it kind of set the set the tone. And really, this video also helped things a lot. I remember Bjork put this video on her website. This video freaked a lot of people out. <laughs> well, I guess also the Nas reference, um, in a sense, I mean, Nas kind of as this very sort of technical, lyrical rapper in a way, right? Of like, um, f from that sort, of, that sort of standpoint, I guess it also signals, you know, your, your claim also in a sense to, you know, make a dope rap record. Um, I think I, I'm wondering also, in a sense, because um, you're you're also rapping very well on one of your first rap records, um, and I'm wondering, like, did that sort of progression, in a sense, come come natural for you in terms of like write from writing poetry to performing poetry over music to performing t like poetry as music in the form of rap? I think so. I think I think I probably would not have been if I hadn't started with the if I hadn't started with the no fear screaming stuff. And uh, then, you know, started doing the spoken word stuff, and then having that come after. I think that's, you know, I think that 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 has that has everything to do with it. Because I didn't start. I mean, you think. I mean, you know, that's like I said. We talk about intention. Like I wasn't like I wasn't like some kid that like wanted to be a rapper, or even a teenager that wanted to be a rapper, or even a 21 year old that wanted to be a rapper. I was already uh, almost 26 there. So it's like, I, this was just, I was just like, I was just exploring stuff. Mm -hmm. And, but at this, so did that in a sense feel like, I mean, you had hit on something basically with, um, with that record or with the mixtape Cosmic Angel in general? Yeah, I mean, but the moment that, I'm gonna be honest, the two moments that, the two moments that shifted my intention from this just being this underground art thing to, Oh wait a minute! Like maybe I could actually like have aspirations of being like a Bowie or a Lou Reed or you know like when I really started to think about myself as a musical artist was Wavy and Hayes Boogie Life. Hayes Boogie Life is the first time I really felt like like I am a rapper. That song, that song, and that in that moment, Wavy was an interesting thing because that song was popular on the internet for a few months, and then. And this is all this fashion stuff. And then a woman who was a writer for Italian Vogue befriended me. And her name was Stefania Pia. And we did a video together, which was just her interviewing me. And, and uh, she w was a writer for Italian Vogue. And the editor, she's passed away now, but the editor of Italian Vogue was a woman named Franca Cezani. And Franca Cezani's son is a man named Francesco Cerezini. Francesco Cerezini saw that video, heard the song. So Francesco is a director, but at the time he was only doing like fashion stuff. Um, and you know, they, they come from this, I mean, they, they come from this fashion, fa fashion dynasty family. But he really at that, at, at that time wanted to be doing music videos for like major labels. But I don't think that he was able to get his foot in the door even though he had this huge fashion background because like most things in life, you have to have the portfolio first. And so I don't think that he, he just didn't have like a music video portfolio that was like, that was that. So in a turn of events that completely transformed my entire career, Francesco met with me, heard the song, we met like two or three times, and then he was like, I wanna offer you, I wanna completely direct this music video for you for free, completely for free for this song. He was like, he was like, this song is doing well on the internet, but I think if we do this video, he was like, it, it could, like, it could, you could, like, it could blow you into another stratosphere. And like I said, at the time, I was like folding t shirts. And you know what I mean? Seriously, like I was like folding t-shirts, like I had entered this weird phase where like I was performing like enough to where I could survive and where I didn't have to have a full-time job, but also where like if I wanted a full-time job, I couldn't really meet the schedule of performing. So it was like a very intense struggle period where like literally sometimes, like sometimes like I, it would be like, do I have money for the subway or like money to eat? Or like, you know what I mean? Like, or money, you know what I mean? Like stuff like that. So Francesco does this video for me 
And I remember, I'll never forget him saying this to me. He was like, because he did, he, did, he did pull in a lot of favors. And he was like, he, I, oh, this is the other thing. I, till this day, I don't know how much he spent. He never told me how much he really spent on the video. But he was like, people are going to think I spent millions on this video. And he was like, this video is going to make you a star. He was like, but I didn't spend millions. <laughs> and that was the wavy video, yeah. Um, but so one thing also you've mentioned in the past was kind of that you, um, you also weren't necessarily like looking for acceptance in the hip hop community, whatever that sort of might, might mean in this day and age. Right. And so, um, but that you had kind of, uh, teenage fans on Tumblr who were getting all your references in a way. Right. Can you, um, elaborate a little bit on like why, why that is important to you? So... Yeah, I can. So, uh, you know, we didn't we didn't know how people were really. We 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 had an idea that people there might be some haters, but when I started out, there was a lot of haters. And you know, I don't I don't need to backpedal and name names and name websites and name writers and name people now who are just like, oh yeah, Mickey, hey. But like back then, I remember certain people, certain websites, uh, certain editors were afraid of posting my videos or my songs because they felt like it would alienate their audience. Um, uh, you know, I remember playing uh, festivals where uh, musical acts like the Flatbush Zombies were literally, I was literally on stage performing and they were on the ground calling me a faggot, like from the audience, um, like literally screaming at me, like, um, uh, um, and I don't mind, I've always, yeah, I don't like them. <laughs> uh, so, like, it, it, ah. and there was this, and you know what, there was always, also, always this, this thing of, like, having to co-op something, you know? Like, I remember I did this South by Southwest event with Ray-Ban, and it was all these rappers, and it was just, like, it was, it was, like, it was always, like, I, I would literally, like, people would literally stop talking if I, like, when I entered the room. I mean, this is, like, I'm not, like, over-exaggerating. This is, like, real shit. And uh, it was just really, like, nasty. I remember A-Track invited me to do Fool's Gold, and I nearly, I nearly got booed off stage. You know what? I literally nearly got booed off stage. It was, like, it was such a, like, a fucked up time. And it's just so funny to me because now all of these young little rappers are, like, walking around with, like, Louis Vuitton purses and stuff. But it's just, like, see, but you know what I mean? But it's, like, it's, it's just, like, that in that short span of time, y'all, people have, like, changed, remember, like, in a lot of ways, like, as far as what they see as palatable and tolerable in this culture and this many cultures. But, okay, so what you just said is important because, so... If it wasn't for social media, I think my career would have gone two ways. I think that either, and I think in the 90s, if I had been doing this, either I would have skyrocketed to fame because it would have been something that people had never seen before, or no one would have known who I was for my entire career, and that's how it would have been. Um, but with social media, what we weren't realizing, and when I say we, I mean me and just other like queer artists or people that were kind of doing something different, like in these like mid 2000s, you know, 2011, 12, 13. Um, I think that we weren't realizing that like these videos and stuff were getting reblogged and retweeted, and and that, and this is also before Instagram, so <laughs> uh, it was it was this 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 thing of like people were now able to feel a sense of agency and where it's like, oh, wait a minute, I can relate to that. Or that person is, is, is using pronouns in a song that like are, are, you know, yeah, I like a her too if I'm a her. I like a him too if I'm a him. And, and social media enabled me to, social media enabled me to have a fan base in a way where, where like a lot of people at the time, all of a sudden we didn't really need the validation of the music industry. And for me in particular, it wasn't as if I was even seeking that validation, but this is what I told my manager. So once I understood the concept of a booking agent, and for people who may not know, you have when you're a musician, you have your manager who manages you. Then the person that actually puts you like on stage that you know is your booking agent and this person takes offers from people that see you and they're like oh we'd like Mickey Blanco to perform here so a booking agent is very important because and this is this and this is in the last you know 10 years or so 
what I what I what I realized was is that I could make money and I could be liked and I could have my own audience and it didn't matter if I was being rejected by mainstream hip hop. It didn't matter if I was being rejected by hip hop at all because if if these group of kids in, in Pittsburgh and these group of kids in Florida and these people in Austin, Texas and these kids in, in London and these kids in, in, in France, if, if these people want me to come and play and they write my booking agent and they make me an offer, oh, wait a minute, I can make money. Wait a minute, I don't actually need anyone's validation. And once I understood that, I remember I told my manager, I said, I want a booking agent on every continent. I said, first of all, I know that I'll do better in Europe. I said, I would rather not waste my energy trying to be, become famous in America where, you know, gay marriage hasn't even passed. It's like, you know, like I'm getting nearly booed off of stage at festivals. I was like, fuck this. Like, like you know, because I, 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 I played uh, my first show in Europe. God, I forget. I think it was 2011 I played my first show in Europe. And the response, I was just like, oh, shit, I've, like, found my people. Like, you know what I mean? Because, I mean, the, the just the history of, like, avant-garde artists being accepted in Europe goes, I mean, it goes as far back as, like, people like James Baldwin and Zerl Neale Hurston and the Harlem Renaissance and, you know, that whole lineage of, of or Josephine Baker. You know what I mean? You have people who were, you know, misunderstood, especially people of color in the States, who went to Europe and fucking became rich and famous and happy. And <laughs> and so I was just like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have to do this. And um, and that really, that was a big deal. This was a big deal because it it enabled me to all of a sudden see a future for myself as a musician. And it was like, it felt like the, I mean, at this time, man, it really did feel like the wild, wild west because it was just like, oh shit, like, yo, like you may not want to wreck, because they were calling, they were labeling me and Leaf and, they, and, and Big Freed is like, you know, is a, is a bounce artist, you know, but they were labeling, they were labeling all of us queer rap and, and even that title at the time was really derogatory because, not because we were not queer artists making rap, but because without even listening to what the songs were about or what we were really trying to communicate, they were just slapping gay on it and let, you know, this is gay and go, you know, go on, go ahead. You know what I mean? Um, it's really embarrassing to think about now, but, you know, just like evidenced by the title of that Fader piece, you know, Crossdresser Extraordinaire. It's like, I, I, I really, people really have to understand that the transgender tipping point, gay marriage, all of this zeitgeist, all of these conversations that used to only be had in academic circles on college campuses, it's like that have now entered the mainstream because of these moments. This was all so alien just like six and a half years ago. And people were really fucking cruel. I mean, they're still cruel. But it's like we were really, I was, I was really playing with the whole different set of like folks. <laughs> and I, when I say folks, I mean like society. Um, we can... We can go back to um, your relationship with Europe. And can I also, have a Red Bull? I'm sure someone would love to bring <laughs> you one. Um, go back to your relationship um, with Europe, and also you mentioned Baldwin. We can get to that in a, in a minute. But I also wanted to um, maybe to, to play something to maybe also illustrate sort of a, a, a sort of musical shift for you. We're jumping ahead a little bit um, in time, but I think... Um, that kind of fits um, fits what you were talking about just now. Um, do you want to listen to a moment with Kathleen? Oh, okay, yeah, we can listen to that. And what you're about to hear is, so I uh, I used to, like I said, everything everything used to my only until my very first album, which came out in 2016, did I stop making. Uh, what I would consider concept stuff, and I'll, I'll get I'll, I'll I'll explain why that is to you. But basically, like Cosmic Angel, the first mixtape, Betty Rebel, the second mixtape, and then Gay Dog Food, the third mixtape, all were super heavily like conceptual ideas. And with Gay Dog Food, this mixtape that the song is from, my idea was I wanted to make a gr a, a grunge rap. I wanted to make a feminist grunge rap album, and so one of the people that was most influential to me when I was like 15 and 16 years old is a musician, is a woman named Kathleen Hanna, who was in a famous band called Bikini Kill, and then later in a band called La Tigra, and she's like one of the front runners 
of a, a, a feminist movement of music called Riot Girl, and it was the first genre of music where I ever even heard the word queer, where I ever heard songs that were talking about lesbianism and about being gay, and uh, but but in this really like really like really cool like just really cool way, um, wasn't really even like that literal. Um, and uh, anyway, I had the chance. It was like a dream of mine I, to work with Kathleen. Um, she doesn't make that much music anymore because um, I think she has, she has lupus, I believe. And, and there's a whole documentary about it. I'm not spilling any tea. Like, but she, like, she's like an amazing, art, amazing artist, but she doesn't record that much anymore. But anyway, we recorded this song together. And, and yeah, it's, this, is, this was like me recording with one of my idols. This is someone who, this is someone who, when I was a teenager, I was, you know, for the first time identifying, you know, as a feminist and, and reading about anarcho-feminism and cyber-feminism and, you know, all of these, all of these really esoteric things that most, most teens, maybe teens nowadays, maybe teens did then, but didn't feel like there were that many of us. <laughs> okay, let's listen to a moment with Kathleen. And it's produced by Gabi. Who was uh, who was uh, my roommate? Who's a really awesome electronic producer, still making music now. And you know what's funny? So, and so Kathleen would affect in a lot of the Bikini Kill and uh, and the Tigra uh, and the Tigra, the Tigra songs. Kathleen would affect this like Valley Girl voice. And I remember someone commented to me shortly after this came out. They were like. Do you even realize that's what you were doing at the start of the song? They were like, you literally sound like <laughs> Kathleen Hanna, like you're referencing Kathleen Hanna. And I wasn't even realizing I was referencing Kathleen Hanna. But, uh, but yeah, anyway, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the reason why I also wanted to play that song here is to also just kind of illustrate a little bit of the... Um, sort of musical trajectory that you're then embarking on, sort of maybe away from sort of more um, um, uh, straightforward rap tropes than what you were doing before. Um, and I am wondering also about like whether, um, like whether you feel yourself gravitating towards any particular like sound or maybe it's a form of delivery or whatever it is or whether you also find yourself gravitating towards exactly that sort of idea of, sh of shape shifting of like not being able to uh, be pinned down in a sense musically. In the, in, in, in the beginning and, and like after, especially after Cosmic Angel because as much as I love my first mixtape Cosmic Angel, it has it has it has its moments of songs like like it has I think the whole thing has like three songs that I would consider like produced well and that are like actually good songs and the rest of it is just like really like <laughs> like uh, and with Betty Rubble things got better but it was like you know Cosmic Angel was me being this messy performance artist and honestly my manager helping me put all these desperate parts into a mixtape. Betty Rubble, the, which, the initiation, which was my second mixtape, was me having this idea of like, what would an acid house goth hip hop record sound like? And on that record, uh, it's really minimal production. Uh, it's a lot of rap, it's like a lot of like rap rapping, like almost in an old school way, like almost in a Nas and a Tribe kind of way. Uh, all, well, it really like Method Man, go, like, I, I think for that record, like Ghostface, Method Man, like Nas, those were huge inspirations. And then on the other side of it was like um, my, my Thrill Kill Colt, Nine Inch Nails, um, Nitzer Ebb, you know. Um, and then with Gay Dog Proof, like I said, this feminist grunge record, but I would just like, that's, that's what I mean. Like I, sometimes I look back and I'm like, if, if I had been more like, careerist maybe my I mean I I feel like just right now I'm about to enter kind of like the the Hollywood phase of my career which is also an interesting thing that's happening right now but uh uh but I always think it's like I didn't I didn't think about stuff like that like I wasn't like you know obviously I wanted if, if I wanted to make a banger I'd be like I want to make a banger but it was always from this like angle of like, oh, I have this idea, I should do this. And I think that's what I mean. I think the confidence from that, I think the confidence from that 
yeah, it was, yes, it was like me being punk and me having these ideas and just wanting to explore them. But after I started to do these shows around the world and make money, it was like, well, I don't have to make like a commercial sounding song that has to somehow end up on the radio to fucking buy a fucking designer shoes if I want. I mean, this is my thinking at the time. It's like, oh, wait a minute. I can actually do what the fuck I want and get paid. That's a really empowering feeling when you really feel that for the first time. And I think, yeah, it's, it's like, it's how, how, what we, I mean, most of us know what it feels like to all of a sudden have a moment where we're like, okay, like I may not be rich, but I can take care of myself. It's such a grounding moment. And it's such a, that moment alone of, of, of some kind of security should, uh, let fireworks off in your head, you know, or, or should allow you to feel as if like, okay, like let's, let's keep going for it or whatever you're doing that works, you know? And I was like, okay, me being myself is working. <laughs> like, let me just continue to like do whatever the hell, you know, I want creatively. Um, um, also, I was also, come on. It's like, I was, I wasn't like mature at all. I, there was like no maturity there. I was, you know, I, I was literally like running, running wild. Um, but I think that's, you know, I think that's really, I think that's really cool because I often think like, wow, like, even though like, I, even though like, you know, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty okay with myself. Like, what if, like, what if I, what if, what if I was younger now and like there was Instagram and like all of a sudden I could look at like this many different people doing things. It's like, would I, would I, would I be a little succubus? Would I, or not even little succubus, but it's like, would it be harder to find my own identity because there are so many attractive identities to choose from? And that's, I think, is one of like the downfalls, sadly, of social media generation, where is where a lot of people can identify with something and they can find their tribe. And then also, I mean, and also a lot of this is just psychologically natural to being young. You're gonna try on different things. You're gonna try on different phases. But creatively, it's, it, um, you know, it, it is this thing of just like, well, I look at this person. Look how attractive they're doing this thing. What if I just sprinkled a little bit of that on me, you know? I, I'm so glad that I didn't start this with that being something that I could like do, you know what I mean? In that way. <laughs> um, not too long after Gay Dog Food though, so Gay Dog Food came out in 2014. Um, in 2015, you for a brief moment uh, announced that you were um, going to be quitting music. Um, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about like that time I, in your life? I can. So, around the time that Wavy came out, I found out that I was HIV positive. And um, I was like, holy shit. I just have this like crazy music video that came out. Like, people are giving me like all this praise. Like, I'm like actually about to start having a musical career. And then like, you know, and you, you know, you, how can I put this? Like, I was, I was always someone who, and I, yeah, it's, it's true. I, I used to get tested a lot. <laughs> and it's like, I, it's, it was almost like a neurosis. I mean, I, I was having sex. I, you know, I was like being like a young gay boy in New York City. But like, I used to get tested like a lot. Like just like that, I think that, I think also it was like this, this fear. Um, and so uh, one day I went to go get tested and I was positive. And um, I was just like, holy shit. So I was like, okay, well, this can't become like public knowledge. And so it became something, you know, that was kept very dear with like close friends. Um, it was really interesting. I actually, when I was negative, like months before, dated. And this person is not the person that I contracted HIV from, but I tell this story because I, because it's honestly a really spiritual thing. Months before I became positive, I actually dated a person who was positive when I was negative, who was like really close to my age. And that experience was, that experience alone, I think saved my life because I remember knowing, and I remember being educated enough in 
kind of like where the whole conversation around HIV was at. Like, I, I knew that like, if you got HIV, that like, you know, what was this, 2011, uh, that you would be okay, that you weren't gonna die, that I didn't know, I mean, I didn't know about specific medications and this or that, but I knew you weren't gonna die. And, uh, and I'm obviously not gonna say his name, but when he and I started, me and this guy started dating, you know, that's one of the first things that he told me, and, and I was just like, oh wow, like how, how did this happen to you? You're so young, and you know, he had his own story. And we dated for like six months, and it was like, you know, he was super healthy. Um, I watched him take his medication every day. You know, it's like that didn't have, and I remember him telling me, because I was one of the first people that he dated after he had become positive. And I remember him saying to me, you know, like, you're, the way that you treat me so normally, I mean, you know, tears, obviously, like, he's just like, I just never thought that someone would treat me this way, knowing this about me. So fast forward to my situation, and I'm just like, oh, my God. So, I mean, obviously, way more tears. And so uh, I, you know, I tell him, I tell my mom, oh, my God, it was just like, so, so you know, and obviously, you know, parents, they just want to protect you. She's like, well, no one can know. And so um, it had been this, like, it had been something that I was just in my private life. And thinking about it, you know, and thinking about, you know, celebrity culture and this and that, and, and, and honestly, just humanity, I, I guess, really, if I had not wanted to not tell the public ever, I guess that would have been my right, right? I mean, that would have been, like, that would have been okay, right? That would have been my, my right, you know? That would have been my, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure we have a lot of people, especially some people that were maybe famous in the 70s and 80s who, who are positive who we don't know, and it's their privacy, and they're of a different generation, and that's fine. Um, but for me, what was starting to happen was, is that, like, I'd, I'd make out with a guy, and then I'd be like, oh yeah, like, I'm positive, please don't tell anyone. Or, uh, you know, a hookup would happen, and there would have to be that conversation before we hook up, where I'm like, uh, you know, um, I'm positive, please don't tell anyone. And so, now, this had been going on for a while, this like, please don't tell anyone, please don't tell anyone, please don't tell anyone, please don't tell anyone. Friends come over, I'm putting my medication in the hamper, um, hiding my medication uh, behind the pasta in, in the back of the, the, the kitchen. So what happens when a person starts to behave like this? You, it almost becomes like a shadow self, you know? At the time, I remember, you know, where the only, at the time, I also had this logic. Well, if I'm positive, then I should only probably, like, date or be with other positive people. So, I mean, one of the only ways I remember that I could meet other guys not being out about being positive was through, like, you know, a hookup app like Grindr. And anyone who is gay or identifies as gay or anyone who really actually even uses, you don't have to be gay, but who uses Grindr knows that that app is full of fucking drugs and that app is kind of full of some dark shit if you, if you get into it. And so, you know, it's like I was meeting, and, and this also goes back to, you know, this whole, I mean, we can have a whole other lecture about homosexuality and, you know, and, uh, and stigma and shame and why people, you know, do things in the dark and why people only meet up at three o'clock in the morning. And we could have a whole entire whole lecture about that. But I was living a shadow life and I was like, and you know what was happening also? I wasn't stupid. I, I would go to San Francisco. I was in New York. I knew that, I knew that there were men that were positive, that were healthy, men that were in normal relationships, men that were, you know, were walking down the street and wrapped up in a cardigan, drinking cocoa, you know, that were positive with their golden retriever. So I knew that these things existed. I knew that it wasn't a death sentence. I knew that I could have this lifestyle. I didn't think I could have it and be famous. I didn't think I could have it and have a career in the industry. And so that post, and so, well, no, that, that post where I was like, I'm gonna stop doing music, I'm gonna become an investigative journalist, was first of all, I was always interested in investigative journalism. And then two, because I really thought, you know what, if I'm gonna be open about, about being positive, there's no way I can have a career in music, I will be completely rejected, there's no way I can be an artist anymore, and I have to make plans for myself. That's another thing, I, I've always been, <laughs> I've always been like, Really, like, I, it's almost, you know how they say some people live in the past and it's not good? 
I'm one of the things about my, my personality, which I always have to send to myself, is I live a lot in the future. I think a lot about the future. My boyfriend and I are always talking about this. Anyway, so you know, I was like, okay, I can't be an artist anymore. That post, I was in such a depression, and I was in such a self hatred. I made that post, and then a few months later, the next post that I made, I on Facebook, I forget. It's like. Uh, you can Google it. <laughs> on, on Facebook, I, um, I'll never forget a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Sean, but his artist's name is Eves Tumor. Uh, before he was Eves Tumor, uh, he was Teams, and we were in Los Angeles, and he was throwing this. He was always really good at throwing these crazy cool parties. And so he was throwing this party, and I was supposed to be, like, arranging, like, the after party. And... I had been touring, and I used to spend my money in really, really, really not good ways. Like, so I had bought, I got this, like, well, actually, that's debatable. I had gotten this, I had gotten this hotel suite at the Chateau Marmont, which is, you know, this, like, celebrity shishi hotel in L.A. And every, and, you know, people were going to, this is where we were going to have, like, the afters. And, um, and I remember, actually, I was so invested in this whole entire thing that, like, I didn't even go to the party. I was, like, decorating this fucking suite. Um, and so, because I also, I like, I like, like, like hosting dinner parties and stuff, whenever. Anyway, so, um, people were supposed to come over, and my medication was there, and, like, I forgot, or something, or I, like, forgot, or I was, or honestly, maybe I was drunk. I just, I, there was, I, I had forgotten the medication was somewhere out. And people were, like, literally, like, like, when I discovered that the medication was there, like out, like people, people were like walking or like maybe like people were called, they were outside and couldn't get in or in the lobby. And I like panicked and like didn't know where to put the medication. And I think I like put it under the mattress or like something like that. But it was like this heightened sense of panic of like, where am I going to put the medication? And I remember after they left, I remember I took out the medication and I remember thinking, like, you can't live like this. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't, this isn't a life. Like, this isn't, like, and, and it's so unreflective of who you are 22 hours out of most days. And so I got on Facebook, and I was just like, I have been HIV positive since 2011, my entire career. And I, I don't know, actually, I don't even know what the, what, what the rest of the quote was, but I put it on Facebook, and... Sh- Boy, that took off. You want to talk about likes? <laughs> that post, Time, Time Magazine wrote about it. Um, Time Magazine hasn't written about me since. And, <laughs> and they hadn't written about me before. But they wrote about that. And what I didn't realize is, I didn't realize that I'm one of the first people to ever do that in that way with my platform I also realized that I think I'm one of the only like musicians besides like Easy E to like who died in the hospital and who never actually came out about it. They found out I think after he died, or maybe he did on his deathbed. I don't want to misconstrue that story. R.I.P. Easy E. Um, but um, but I, basically, I realized that like the way in which I did that shit hadn't been done in that way, and like I wasn't even thinking about it like that. I was thinking that I was gonna wake up on Monday morning, and my manager and everybody was gonna be like, "Oh, we can't really work with you." Um, you know, I just—I mean, what what example did I have? I had Magic. Jo- Everyone that I knew that had publicly come out as being HIV positive was publicly shunned. I mean, and we all know this is also true. So it's like, what example did I have of anyone being positive? And even though I knew that people were, ha- were happy and healthy in the real world, these weren't the celebrities that we enjoy and, and whose work that we digest, you know? Exactly. So in a sense, we were, um, you were talking about that you also um, wanted to quit music at that time. You, um, in 2016, you released um, your album, Mickey. And... Um, I would like to play a, a, a video from that album um, because I think it also illustrates kind of maybe a new way for you to um, to incorporate also more sort of political um, messages also into into your work. 
Well, before, because what? Okay, I'm just gonna be like, okay. So before you, before you, before you show, before you show that video, I just want to quickly say that. So basically, after I came out, like I was positive, I thought like, oh my god, the world's gonna be over, and so. Like, there was, like, probably, like, a seventh or eight-month-long media cycle where every time someone would write about me, they would fucking write about me being positive. And I was just like, okay, well, my career's not over, but, like, it's just, like, fuck. Like, how, I mean, how many times are they going to always include, like, HIV? It, it, so then it, so it went from being queer rapper or gay rapper to HIV-positive rapper Mickey Blanco. And, you know, I think I made some posts that was like, you know, you writers that are doing that, do you realize that every time you do that, you're just re-stigmatizing me? Do you realize that every time you do that, you're just basically reinforcing the stereotype of, like, otherness? And, and that by, you, so, so if someone reads an article about me, if you're going to put that as the first line they're reading, the person's going to already have some idea in their head before they even know what the fuck the song or the video is about. Um, and so, uh, just really quickly, that moment was important because I thought everything was over. Everything wasn't over. There, I, I, I never realized that people could be so compassionate, that people could, that people could really kind of lift me back up. And one of the people that lifted me back up was the producer Woodkid. Um, he was just like, you're not going to quit music. You're going to come to Paris, and we're going to work on music together. And that moment is what led to like the nucleus of uh, my first album. Also, right after I announced... Um, I started working with this electronic label called K7 because my career had entered this weird phase where it wasn't stalling, but like I had, before the, I had come out as HIV positive, I had had a meeting with XL Records and they were like, oh, we love what you're doing, but like you're already pretty much a developed artist and we can't really develop you. I had had a meeting with Capitol Records that was just like, oh, you're doing really cool stuff, send us more music. Um, so it was like, it was time for me to kind of align myself in a way to like get larger exposure, but it like just wasn't happening. And then this relationship with K7 happened and they were super supportive. They allowed me to start Dog Food Music, which was like, which, which is, um, which is my own, uh, my own label. And uh, yeah, and so, yeah, and then we had the album, which is, which is kind of the first time I ever made music that was not conceptual. When I made my album, the first album, Mickey, that was out in 2016, I was like, for the first time, like, this isn't gonna be a concept. You're gonna make songs about you. You're gonna make songs about your lived experience. Um, this isn't gonna be through the guise of anything other than, like, you know, who you are and, and what you've done and, and, and all that stuff. Okay, let's watch High School Never Ends, the video for And this that. was directed by, by Matt Lambert. And, and just really quickly, you know, whenever I do a video, I always think to myself a lot of things. But one of the things that I think is, where, what, as a queer person, what have I, ne what, what have I never seen other queer people do? And so the idea for this video was initially born out of this idea that I had with Matt, which is, I've never seen a queer anarchist. Let's make a video about queer anarchists. And so that's, you know, that's always kind of where my brain goes at first. And so, yeah, we'll we can watch the video. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about what that what that video represents to you also in a sense what it what it meant for you um as an as an artist um when you were when you were making that yeah that 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 video like so at the end of it at the at the, at the very end scene i remember there's this thing um in uh, that you can use uh that they, they can induce tears it's called a tear stick and it's like this mentholated stick and I remember telling Matt, uh, the director, I was like, Matt, I don't think I need, I don't think I need a tear stick. I think I could, I could really do it. And, and I started crying. And I remember, like, it's one thing to be in the moment, but I remember, like, thinking about, I get emotional now, but I remember thinking about, you know, there's, you think about all of those times where you, because you start this, you know, and, and you, may, you may start it, you may start it not wanting to be some big celebrity or something, but once you see your potential or once you see like, okay, like perhaps like this could really be, a, a, my dream could come true, you, you want it and, you, and you, start to, you start to yearn for it. And I, and, and, I, and I think that what this video to me represents so much of is it's like 
when I was 19 and dropping out of college, it's like I was living in queer punk houses, you know what I mean? Where we would fucking take acid and drink brass monkeys and you know, it's like, it was a really, it was a really romantic period in my life and I, I think about all of those times where I wanted to be so much more but I just didn't know what I wanted to be yet, you know what I mean? Or where I saw something, where I had a goal or, or even, or even like I said, when I thought like my whole entire world was gonna crash in on me, um, you know, when I admitted that I had been HIV positive and that I was, you know, living, you know, healthily with HIV, it's it's like, it's this feeling of of of, of just like there's just this this feeling that every time you transcend something, every time you have transcended something and you continue to transcend something, it's like it it's every time you think the sky is about to fall down on you, it it, it doesn't. You know what I mean? And it's like you also realize there are just, there are, there are so actually many worse things that could happen than losing a career or losing this, you know what I mean? It's like, it, for, for, you know, for, 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 for me, you know, if, if I were to lose my sight, that, you know, that would be, that would, that would break my heart more than anything I've experienced, you know, living with HIV or, or I don't know, having a close family member die or all kinds of traumas that you, that you can happen and, and that can happen and I think that I think that oftentimes, and it's, it's natural, we, we all do this, I, I, I still do this, but sometimes you can get so attached to a trauma that you can then allow that trauma to define you. And then when that trauma defines you, you, you build a story about yourself and about your life. And unfortunately, sometimes it can be a victim story. And when you start to believe that victim story, that victim story can start to create behaviors or you can make excuses or, you know, or I am this way because of my trauma and you have to accept me being rude or you have to accept that I'm flaky or you have to accept that I can't get to work on time or that I crumble every time I watch this commercial or that my fucked up relationship with my father has to characterize every single aspect of my life. But you become a prisoner of yourself when, when, the, when those things happen. And it's really natural, it's a really human thing to do. But when you can catch it and when you can, when you can transcend it, and that transcendence can then become a reminder. It's like every time that you can, even, even in the most minutia of your thoughts, you know, uh, it's like it's like you know this this year I decided to to delay my album you know I decided to delay my album and I was like you know what I, I should probably focus on sobriety my sobriety more and and certain things that I felt like were starting to get really shaky again and you know I got depressed for a while because I thought to myself why can't I be different why can't I be better why can't I why can't I be one of these people to not have these problems. And, and just have my life go forward. But it's like, no, it's like, you know what? This is something that I need to transcend and that probably will be something I continually have to transcend and that's okay. So for me to see this video, I think overall for me, it, it's like this video for me and, 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 and a lot of the, over, the, the, the overarching themes and what I do is it's just like from the very beginning, people really second guessed me. And it didn't matter if I was super talented, it didn't matter what I had done, because it was so taboo, there was always this feeling of being second guessed. And I transcended that, and I'm still transcending that. Um, and like I said, it's like I, I this, it's, it's, it's even to be doing this talk, like I haven't had like a lifetime retrospective, you know? Like I haven't made like, I've made a lot of stuff, but like it's not like, you know, I'm like, you know, a Genesis P. Orge or, you know, someone who's had a lifetime body of work. The fact that people are interested enough in, in what has happened in, in this trajectory thus far, I'm really, really grateful for. And I just want to keep transcending shit. <laughs> um, yeah, I find it also just very beautiful that, you know, in that video, I mean, we talked, we've talked about poetry, we talked about acting, we talked about music. Um, where all of this, in a sense, also comes together, and to, for you to, in a sense, kind of come back with 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 that kind of statement, where it really, you know, and also, I mean, this also comes into into play with uh, with political political aspects, political messages in, into your music. So I think it's really powerful that also everything um, comes together in that video. Um, but so you're you're mentioning your your new album, so. Um, 
maybe um wanna, oh, let's yeah let's are we ready let's, let's yeah wrap you this brought up. some you oh, God, brought yeah, some you guys are probably your butts you're probably ready to get up aren't you uh, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. You know, you mentioned it now, so we can we can go there. Maybe we find yeah. other things to talk about, and we'll open it up to the audience also in a few minutes. Okay. But yeah, um, you said you wanted to play us something from your new album. Yeah. Since I found out that this is since so since I found out that this is not like the music won't be online, um, I'm gonna just play you guys um, like two, maybe one or two, if you want to hear the second one of the new songs from. Uh, the album that's that's not gonna come out. Well, the first single will be out in October. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Just briefly before we take a few questions from the audience, what what is um, what is important for you in a collaboration? Uh, it's super, I mean, I almost can never work like just off the internet. I always have to be in the room with the person, you know what I mean? And um, I think if anything, the most important thing with me in, in a collaboration is that we just both kind of like are vibing on the, on the composition. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not like a dictator in the studio. Like if another, art, like I'm working with this artist because this artist can bring something to, like that, that I don't have, you know what I mean? Or that, or that I could learn from. And so I just think it's this give and take of like letting them do, like honestly letting them do their thing. Obviously I'm gonna go and like edit and like, you know, end up cleaning up what I think is appropriate for the track. But it's like, it's that freedom of like, you know what I mean, of like, I mean, I'm gonna be honest, like I've, I've been a Saul Williams and an Avenger Banhart fan since I was damn near like, like uh, freaking learning how to masturbate. So it's just like, you know what I mean? It's just like to, to have a song where like Avenger Banhart's doing the intro to my fucking track. I like, I'm just like, ah, and then to have a track where I'm literally like spitting like poems with Saul Williams. It's just like, that's for me like, like life changing shit. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you for playing those uh, tracks, Mickey, and, and, and thank you very much for, for this conversation. Please, everybody, give a warm round of applause to Mickey Blanco. Yeah.